We are live. I hope everyone's doing well. Starting to learn how to adapt to this new way of living. We are looking for Shoheen. Tour striker Martin Chuck, how's it going, buddy? Steve, John, Kevin, we're looking for Shoheen. Tom Shaw. Shoheen, where are you, Shoheen? Tom Johnson. Pete Roach, Galway Bay, Llewellyn. Good to see you back, Llewellyn. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We're trying to find Shoheen. I'm sure he'll be in here in a minute. Where are you? Mark Grace, Reed, nice to see you, Reed. Hope you're doing well, buddy. Shoheen, where are you, Shoheen? Come on, pal. You see, it's. I oftentimes assume people know how to get in here, but it's not the case. Let's try this again. There he is, he's there. Here we go. He's coming in. Shoheen, there he is, top of the morning. What's going on? How you doing, mate? Pretty good, trying to not go crazy like everyone else. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the temp out there? Is it getting better? It is, actually. It hasn't snowed in about a month. It's been a good sign. There's no more snow on the ground. So, so far, uh, we would have probably started golfing right around this time, but I guess we're going to have to wait a little longer. We are going to have to wait. You know, and it's almost like when you're hungry and you got to wait for that, that, that great meal to arrive, it makes it that much better. So I know it's going to be that much better when we do get out there. Uh, Shohit, thanks so much for joining us, mate. Yeah, it's a pleasure, dude. I've been following along with everyone else who's come on. I think this is a great opportunity for people to learn. So why not take advantage? Hey, no, I agree. I agree. The one thing I've noticed, and I've had quite a few of my students watch almost every session that we've done. And I really would encourage everybody, if you've missed a few, uh, to go back to my YouTube channel and try to watch all of them if you've got the time. It's quite a bit of time, but try to watch all of them because I find that as a golfer, if you watch all of them, you'll really start to pick up a common thread from coaches like yourself and Jeff Smith and Chris Como and Mark Bull and Brett McCabe. And you'll start to go, okay, I start to see what playing good golf is really all about. And I really would encourage everybody to try to watch as many as possible. Uh, not because I need the likes or anything, although that would be good or the views or whatever you call it, uh, but really so that people can benefit from it. And I think it's cool to watch one, but it's so much better. The sum of the parts are greater than those individual parts. Uh, try to watch as many as you can. Yeah, you definitely, you definitely start to notice, a, I guess, a tendency in the philosophies and how they kind of overline with each other. And then you're like, oh, okay, I guess if everybody's kind of teaching, I guess not necessarily similar things, but understanding that some things are really bad in the golf swing and some things are really good, maybe we should start paying more attention to it, you know? Mm. Mm. And, and there is certainly a way to approach it. I think golfers will oftentimes look for, my take is golfers will oftentimes look for details pertaining to their golf swings that they think they need. And that can yeah. be a little bit of a problem. That can be a problem, especially when, you know, you've got a lot of them. I've got a lot of them. YouTube tinkerers, golfers who will watch everything. And I know there's plenty of you on here. I see your names down the bottom there. There's plenty of you on here right now uh, looking for that little bit of magic. And the best thing you can do, I had somebody contact me that worked that they wanted to get a club fitting with Ian Fraser and one of my students and he reached out and he said do you think I could send in some track man numbers and, and Ian could help me out that way and I said I don't think that's the way to do it I really don't if, if, if you really are looking for help go and see Shoheen go and see these great coaches I uh, contact them set up the time and, and, and get the details there and then go work on it 
Yeah, first of all, if you start reading into track my numbers without knowing how those numbers are being created, that is a problem waiting to happen. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Certainly as a coach, certainly as a coach, no doubt about it. Uh, Shaheen, yeah. how did you get into this golf thing? How did you become uh, a golf coach? How did you get your knowledge? How did you become so knowledgeable? Uh, I think my story is very different than most people, to be honest. I didn't grow up uh, as a country club kid, kind of a municipal guy, just played random tracks around my house. Actually, I think it would surprise a lot of people to know the first time I broke 100, I think I was like maybe 18. So I, I really was not a good golfer growing up. Uh, and then it kind of was like this thing where I went from breaking 100 to breaking 70 for the first time in like a two-year span without taking lessons. So I got really good, really fast, kind of luckily. Um, and what ended up happening was I kind of just, I used to play soccer at a high level. So European football, uh, who's, for your my, who's your team? Uh, I'm a Romanista guy. I'm Italian. So I have to go for AS Roma. Um, I'll allow that. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, I ended up tearing my ACL and kind of just took the game more seriously to learn about it. And I guess like everybody else, you know, you sitting around doing nothing kind of like we're doing now. And I just took advantage and learned a lot about the golf swing. So. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Who would you say had the biggest influence on you? Because I must say this, when I watch, I, I've been following you for a couple of years now, and I don't think there's ever been, a, I'm going to say a swing coach that I've watched online that I've watched their stuff and never gone, ah, that didn't really make sense. Or mm, I don't know if that was 100% right. Uh, but every single thing of yours that I watch, I go, that was beautiful. That, that, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. So your knowledge is first rate. And not that it has to come from me, but you really know your stuff, mate. How did you get there? Uh, well, I appreciate that. Um, I, I take a very mathematical approach to the golf swing. I mean, I, I studied math and science in school. That's what I have a degree in. Okay. Uh, so, so numbers come really easily to me. Unlike writing a piece of paper, for me, I'm not creative in that sense. Uh, so I really just look at the golf swing in numbers, to be honest. I mean, I, I literally see a movement and I go, okay, this movement equals X amount of degrees in a certain direction. How yeah. does that affect the other movements? And I kind of, I guess in that regard, that's why it's hard to combat a lot of what I teach because it's based on math and on numbers. So, I mean, if math doesn't really lie to you, right, there's a formula, the formula equals yeah. a certain, it equals a certain result. It's not really opinion based. Nothing I teach, or at least I try to teach nothing opinion based. Yeah, uh, which is why it's hard to argue, I guess, with some of the stuff I talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I must say it's uh, it, it is good stuff. And if anyone on here doesn't follow Shaheen, he's he's the business. Please give him a follow. Uh, Shaheen, one thing you talk about a lot in your coaching is matchups. And this is a relatively new term. I would say it's a relatively hot term at the moment. Yeah, uh, in large part due to you and your influence. But matchups are important and matchups are something I, I must say, you know, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't uh, understand them. I didn't even know what they meant. It was always a case of, well, now we've got to try to get this person to this. Um, and I, I had a good chat with Boyd Summerhays the other day and, and there's, there's preferences and there's matchups. And I, I think something that all coaches need to understand and golfers need to understand as well is if you're an 18 handicapper and you're coming to me for a lesson, you're going to get my preferences because your matchups are not even close. They're not really working that well. And so you're primarily going to get my preferences. If you're a tour player coming to me or a high level competitive golfer, we're going to stay within your framework, but we're going to get the matchups to work better. Would you say that's an accurate way to look at it? A hundred percent. I think it's important to look at when a player comes to you is at a very high level. They obviously have a certain foundation of movements within their swing that work really well. I yes. mean, this person became a professional with a movement pattern that obviously it leads to good results. Uh, so it's, it's, you can't take a guy like that and just completely overhaul his pattern. The chances of him recreating that same level of scoring is probably going to be diminished. So he's probably going to get worse as a golfer. Yes. So, so it's very different, obviously, dealing with high-level professionals compared to dealing with your everyday golfer. I mean, you kind of said it, right? Yeah. A 20 handicap comes to you. He's not, he's not leading to good results. He's not obviously scoring the way he wants. So there's something within that movement pattern, that framework of his, that obviously is out of position, that doesn't work. 
And so, I mean, there is a big difference between preferences and matchups. There are matchups that work that I do not like. That doesn't necessarily mean they don't work. It just simply means prefer, that yeah. I don't prefer them. I don't necessarily like them. I mean, I think anybody who follows me on social media sees a lot of similarities in a lot of the players I work with. Yeah. Um, so just to provide one example for, for people listening, I mean, you know, a guy who comes in with a really steep shaft, oftentimes is, you're going to see a lot of early extension to the spine to try to correct the shaft angle issues. If they find the right combination between those two pieces, that could actually lead to a good result oftentimes. Yeah. It's very timing based, but it is a functional matchup if you consider that. A guy who has a really steep shaft angle who rotates a lot and doesn't find a way to correct that shaft, that's actually not working very well. Yeah. And that's the guy that we see who's modern day over the top or, you know, you're, you're really 30, 40 handicap. So what ends up happening in that scenario is, okay, well, just because a matchup works doesn't mean it's your preference and it doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to lead to good results. It might be very, very timing based. And obviously the golfer can't recreate that timing if they don't practice often enough or hit enough balls or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. Well said. Well said. I, 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 I've got to agree. Shoin, can you give us an example of uh, some matchups? Um, you just pick a few. You just pick a few. Uh, and I've got a couple. If you don't mention them, I'll throw them at you at the end there. Uh, for starters, I think I, I wrote an article about four years ago on the golf grip. Um, yes. I think this is one of the most obvious matchups that a, an up and coming coach can learn about is the idea of trying to find the right combination between how we hold the club in our fingers versus what our wrist conditions are doing in the golf swing. This is obviously something that I speak about. You speak about, we all do. Um, you know, when you, when you change your grip pattern. So if you go from like a really, really strong lead hand grip to something that's very weak, where like the lead hand is very underneath. I mean, you're presetting your wrist in a certain type of condition when the face angle is square in your setup position, right? So yes. what ends up happening is, is in order to retain that square club face and not let it deviate too far from its original position, you can't let the wrist go too far off of where it was preset. And yeah. so if you have a super, super strong grip, you're presetting that wrist most likely in a very cupped position, very extended. Yeah. I mean, if you have a strong grip and you start to flex that wrist out, which is going to close the club face more, you're going to shut the face so hard, you got no chance, right? You're going yeah. to do something with the body at the last second to try to correct it or offset that. Um, so that would be one super obvious matchup is, you know, try to find the right combination of understanding where the grip is and where your wrists are and how they work together to make sure the club face is leading to obviously good results for you. That's a, that, that, that's a biggie there. That's a biggie. I'll never forget. It must have been about a decade ago. I was teaching a golfer with the strongest grip you could imagine. And he was slicing it like a maniac. And I, I thought to myself, okay, you know, I have no idea what I'm going to do simply because I've, I've, the grip credit is out the window. And, yeah. and, and then I looked at the club face on the way down. And this player had the greatest cupping in their lead wrist on the way down you could ever imagine. And the face was wide open. And I ended up, to a certain degree, figuring it out by going, I think we need to weaken your grip and get your wrist a little more that way. And, and uh, that was kind of the start of me really, I, I didn't label it a matchup, but I just understood things better and how things need to be plugged in together. Yeah, actually, it's kind of funny. I, I deal with more golfers who hit push cuts with stronger grips than I do with weaker grips because Either the face gets too closed and they try to stand up at the last second to avoid hooking it and it just leads to like a high push cut. Or what ends up happening is they're doing something at the last second with the wrist that's trying to still avoid it. Like kind of like you said, where they keep the wrist so much this way that it still creates problems. And, you know, I'm, I'm, if I could lead to the preferences kind of argument that we spoke about, I, yeah. I'm not a big fan of the strong grip for the most part. If a player comes to me with a really, really good pattern and their grip is strong, I'm obviously never going to touch it. I mean, that would be foolish. But if a player comes to me struggling and I see their grip is strong, oftentimes that extension on that wrist leads to a lot of poor shaft movement too. And that shaft movement is going to dictate a lot of what your body has to do at the bottom. And then from there, obviously, it creates a lot of problems. So what I'll do is I'll weaken the grip to allow the wrist to get here. And all of a sudden, you start to notice a lot better shaft movement, which frees up the body to do things that it wasn't able to do before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. If... Shohin, talk to us, what if, let's just play a little game here. What if Brooks Kepka yeah. came to you and he said, I need help. 
Well, what for starters, for starters, with his hands as out as they are in the downswing, because he's got no depth to the hand path. Like those that, hands are way out in front of his body. That's why. That's why I threw his name at you. Yeah. We're so four matchups here. When his hands are that far out, and his wrist is this bone coming down, his attack angle is going to be very steep. Right. I mean, we yes. see his attack angle clearly steep. If you look at his track man numbers, they are very down. Yes. When your wrist is in this type of motion, you're hitting that down on the ball with the amount of speed he has. I mean, it's no surprise to me at all, to be honest, that he struggles with wrist issues. There is no way your body can support the amount of tension that rides up the shaft right into that wrist when you're like this coming down and hitting that down on it at 110 miles an hour with a, or whatever, 100 miles an hour with a seven iron, you know? Yeah. So if, if, I mean, I don't really know what his physical limitations are. I don't know enough about his game to talk about that, but I, I would obviously try to shallow out his attack angle just to give him some freedom with the wrist so that he doesn't consistently deal with injuries, to be honest, long-term, because I feel like that's what's going to end up happening if we keep seeing the same pattern from him in the next five, 10 years. So your take, you just off the cuff here, is that, uh, he hits down too much, and that is long-term going to lead to injury. Specifically because his wrist is way too bowed coming down, which obviously you're not going to touch this part. I mean, you can't. It's too much ingrained in his pattern. So I would manipulate where the hands are to kind of shallow him out a little bit, yeah. So you would try to get his arms deeper? Slightly, yeah, for sure. Okay, okay, yeah. And that's why I threw him at you, because um, w when I think of matchups, I think of arms more out – requires less chest rotation and more trail side bend. Yeah, and we see that with two specific golfers the most, I would say, or at least guys that I talked about the most, which is DJ. DJ, if people actually look at DJ's pattern, I mean, his arms are obviously very, very tall at the top of the back yes. thing. He has an enormous amount of side bend. If you look at his shoulder plane through the golf ball, it's very, very vertical because he's so leaning this way that that front shoulder kind of kicks way up on him. Yeah, that typically you'll see a lot of back issues with that long term. Now, if that's the case with him, I mean, he's so flexible in such good shape. Maybe he can kind of offset that tendency. But uh, he would be a guy. JT would be another guy. I mean, Justin Thomas, if you ever look at his pattern, I mean, he's got a lot of side bending as well. Uh, obviously, yeah. ob obviously, that's a matchup that re they're required to do because of how upright their arm is at the top of the backswing. Yeah, yeah. And I think just as a note to all the golfers and coaches out there, if you've got a good player as a coach, if you've got a good player coming to you, even as a junior, I, I always remember the story that Cameron McCormick told when Jordan Spieth first came to him. He looked at, he looked at Jordan's grip with, you know, these fingers kind of sticking out all over. And, he, and Jordan was busy telling him how he shot 63. I think this was as a 13-year-old, how he shot 63 and won this tournament yesterday. And Cameron just went, okay, I'm going to leave that thing alone. Uh, and you look at Jordan's grip, and it's really much the same today. Uh, I think as a golfer, we need to understand you don't have to. There is no – if there's one thing we've learned in the last 20 years, it's that there is no one way to swing the golf club. There is no Adam Scott perfect has to be this way in order for the ball to go the way you want. There's lots of different ways. As long as we can get the ingredients right and put the right things in, it's going to be able to function very nicely. I mean, you see a perfect matchup with Tiger. I mean, Tiger's shaft angle is not very shallow coming down. I mean, he's yeah. always been a relatively steep player. If you look at his chest, his chest doesn't really rotate through the golf ball that well. I mean, his chest is relatively square at impact, and his yeah. front shoulder is typically always a little bit higher. He's doing this to kind of offset the fact that he's not super shallow. He has no choice to do that. I mean, it obviously yeah. works for him. He's the best player, arguably, of all time. But, you know, that's a matchup that clearly you need if that pattern is, you know, the pattern that Tiger has. So there is no one way to swing the club. You just got to find the right blend of all these variables to give you your desired result. If that's the case every single time, I mean, you don't really need to make changes, right? For sure. For sure. Um, Shohin, talk to us a little bit about uh, talk to us a little bit about your preferences. What do you like to see if you had a really talented, fully engaged, thirteen-year-old golfer who was big and strong, and they were coming to you and saying, "Look, I love golf. I work at it like crazy," and they just soaked up everything you said. What would you look for? What are some of the preferences you would like to almost build into their golf swing? If I had a priority, number one, it would be try to create the appropriate tilting pattern in the backswing to give them a chance not only to rotate better, but also to create less restriction so that their body doesn't take a beating long term. 
I mean, the goal of every golfer, in my opinion, should be their health, regardless of what your pattern looks like. It's to protect your body to keep playing. This is a game for a lifetime. We always say it, right? Yeah. So I would obviously, first of all, look for speed. I mean, if you're a junior player, swing as hard as you can and learn to find the ball later. That's kind of a big thing for me. You know, it's a lot harder to teach a guy as they get older who's swinging slower to add speed than it is to take a junior player to just rip as hard as they can through it and then give them the proper mechanics later. Yeah. Um, but if I had a choice to say prioritize one thing, it would be create proper tilts in the backswing, get some extension to that back leg. Don't create so many restrictions where you're keeping that back leg too flexed because then it doesn't allow the hip to open up and it puts a lot of pressure on the body. So free you up. I mean, free you up. Less restrictions, the better. That's kind of where I would prioritize things. Okay. Okay. I like that. I like that. Um, that's something I, I must say that I know 10 years ago, we wouldn't have heard any coach say, and it's interesting to me how, and certainly I, I, I follow the crowd oftentimes, but it's interesting how that coaching mentality, uh, shifts from one side to the other. And we've certainly shifted and, and it's primarily due to influence. I, I was talking to Gigi earlier in the week. And I, I said, Gigi, you've had tremendous influence and, and he didn't really buy it. And I said, trust me, you do. Uh, you, you've opened people's eyes to shallowing the club and rotation and using the ground, uh, freeing things up in the backswing, certainly. And I know 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that would not have been discussed primarily due to the people at the top of the pyramid who were really influencing. Showing you, you've used the internet and social media very, very well. I know when I first bumped into you, I think you were only on Twitter. Yeah, it's very possible. Yeah, it's very possible. Which one came first? I think you were only on Twitter and you had a ton of followers on Twitter and you weren't on Instagram and then you went on Instagram and the next thing I looked, you had a ton of followers on Instagram. You got to tell me how to do this. Uh, I was definitely on Twitter first. I think that's more okay. so just because of the timeline of things. Twitter obviously was more popular before yeah. Instagram was ever yeah. a thing. Me too. Uh, so I was on Twitter probably in like 2009, 2010. Uh, and honestly, I would just tweet random golf facts when I was bored when I started. It wasn't really anything like golf swing related. Um, and then over time, I just started to kind of just give my thoughts on random things. Uh, just you know, hey, I don't really like the way this player is doing things. I would probably change it up and whatever. And, you know, over time, I guess people start to pay attention to what you're saying. Maybe they kind of like what your opinions are. And, you know, you start to gain following from that. People talk, word of mouth kind of happens. Mm. And then I decided to start an Instagram page from that and kind of just make it solely prioritizing golf. I mean, if you look at my page, obviously, there's no personal stuff. I'm a very private person when it comes to my, my own private life. Um, so I just post a lot of golf shit. I think uh, people are interested to hear it. And I guess it kind of blew up there. You know, before, obviously, be before the last year or two, Instagram used to be really easy when you post information to get your word out there. Obviously, yeah. the, the algorithms that they've changed made it a lot more difficult. You have to be a little more creative in how you get your kind of information out to the public. Uh, but, you know, I, I used to practice in front of, the, as ridiculous as it sounds, I used to practice in front of the camera talking, kind of like you. I'm sure you did similar stuff. Okay. I mean, if you look at my first videos, they are horrible. My communication is so bad. The information I'm saying is not clear enough or concise. I don't explain the concepts very well. And I guess just through practice, you develop a comfort level of being in front of the camera. You learn how to explain things differently, which I believe is very important for a coach. Um, you know, it's one thing to be able to explain a certain concept one way, but in my opinion, the skill level of a coach becomes talking about the same concept in eight different ways because people learn differently. And I think that if you're a coach up and coming, I think that would be a huge skill that you can you can get to. Um, and obviously, you know, over time, people just start following along. I guess it kind of just blew up that way. Yeah, I, I really think it's the most important thing that a golf coach can do is get themselves in front of, in front of a camera and practice their presentation, simplify, make it concise is the term you used. I like that. Uh, ultimately, we've got to be able to communicate something that's complex in a simple manner so that the people receiving it can go out and use it and ultimately benefit from it. I think it's invaluable to, to any coach to get in front of a camera. And even if you're not putting out information, and I want to talk about online stuff with this pandemic, even if you're not as a coach putting out information, use this time to film yourself. Get out there and say, okay, I'm going to talk for one minute 
about the grip and see if you can make it interesting and understandable, whatever your topic might be. It's a great, great thing to have because ultimately you may not be in front of a crowd, but you're in front of a person of an audience of one. I think that the biggest mistake people do is they fall between two extremes. Either they take a very complex topic and they keep it way too complex. You know, you have to yeah. make the assumption, especially when you're speaking to the masses like we are, that you that people don't understand golf lexicon. They don't understand the terminology. So, you, you know, it, it, it's one thing to explain things that are complex in a simplified way, but you also don't want to get to the other extreme where it's like you dumb it down so much that people don't even really understand what you're saying because you're not explaining enough information about a certain topic. So yeah. you'll, you'll kind of see one of both ways. A lot of times, if you look at my captions, let's say when I'm talking about like a student that I worked with, you know, I use the golf lexicon a lot, but at the same time, I'll try to put parentheses next to it of saying like, you know, they're pronating the left forearm, but at the same time, really, it's just forearm rotation. It's just forearm roll. Yeah. Like, you know, so that they can match the two together. And over time, if you keep seeing the same words come up, with the same explanation in brackets, oh, then they start to figure out, okay, this is what that means, this is what that means, and we start to get it. Because you can't, you just can't say like, hey, get your, like, I see people doing online lessons sometimes or videos on the internet, and they're, like, we, we obviously understand it when we're watching it, but I can already make the assumption that if I was a guy who's just picking up the game and I'm watching this video, like, there's no fucking way, sorry Man. for swearing, yeah, that I'm understanding anything this guy said, it's too complicated. And so you, you got to find that right kind of balance where you're giving enough information where it is clear and they understand what you're saying. But at the same time, you're not using these big fancy words just for the sake of using them where people don't really know what's going on, you know? Correct. Correct. And I think a lot of golf coaches will start going radial and flexion, extension, ulnar. Let, let's, let's get away from that. Keep it simple. Yeah. Cupped, bowed, you know, arched whatever you want to use, but, but try to not use those appropriate medical terms. And a lot of coaches will, will push for, hey, we should learn to do that. That's well and good as a coaching community, but there are millions of golfers out there who are not online, who are not learning this stuff. They're just looking for help. Let's speak their language. We cannot convert them over to our language. We need to learn to convert our language to their language. I mean, I think the reality is, to be honest, as big as the Instagram golf community is, we're still such a small percentage of the golf world. So totally. small. I mean, I mean, I would I would estimate that it's probably under 20 percent of people who play golf are on social media, to be honest. There's such a Wait, older gen. There's so, there's so many more people who are playing golf who are not on the Internet that. I mean, if these people are looking at your shit, even if it's just once through their son who's on social media or something, and they are going to get so fucking confused. I mean, they're skipping right all along. They're, they're not going to learn what you're saying, and they're not going to come to you. If they don't understand your language through a video, they're definitely not going to come take a lesson with you. So you have to keep that in mind at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I, and I can tell you this, uh, Shaheen, and I'm sure you've had a similar experience. I have a database, and I try to keep my database as small as possible, which is different to what most people do in that when I send people my, my database information via email or any way I do, I want them to open it. And if you don't open my information for two months, then I send you a separate email that says, hey, do you want to hear from me or not? If you don't, I'm going to take you out. If you do, it's going into spam or something like that. But I know that the majority of golfers are not on social media simply by sending my monthly newsletter via email because most of my clients are typically older and they have the time and the revenue to be able to afford to work on their game and play golf. And I get this amazing response from an email that I send, but I can post something on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and it's like, uh, you get a, you know, you get a response, but it's really nothing compared to that huge demographic out there that's not on social media. And I think as golf coaches, we lose sight of that a little bit. We think the whole world is on here with us. And that is not the case. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I guess I would differ just in the sense of because a lot of my um uh, my students come from social media, obviously, because of the things that yes, I post and talk sure. about. My demographic typically is a lot younger because Your of that, Your demographic right? is Instagram, no doubt. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So 
because of that, I guess it, it's, you know, I get these guys who are interested in that and they do read up on the data and they are interested in yeah. learning more about the golf swing. And I, I guess it, I mean, to, to your, to your point, like it's super important to cater also to the type of demographic that you deal with more often than not. I mean, you can't just, I can't be talking to old people the same way I'm talking to the younger generation or vice versa, because there's going to be obviously a miscommunication at some point. Exactly right. Exactly right. And I think a lot of, a lot of coaches miss that. A lot of coaches don't really grasp that. Most of my students are just happy that they've figured out email. They're good with email and they're like, I got this email thing figured out. Send me an email. I'll get it. No, no. I posted it on Instagram. What's that? I don't have that. Send me an email. Some of them are good with Facebook and email. And depending on your demographic, I think as coaches, we've got to be aware of who we're pointing our information to. And for you, you're more of the competitive, younger, college, young, professional uh, type demographic. For me, I'm the older guy who's typically just retired, not solely, but typically uh, just retired. And they're looking to um, get some work in on their golf games. So I think uh, it's important for us to be aware of that too. Eh? Yeah, I mean, it's so funny because the amount of young people that I work with that are constantly sending me videos from Instagram and Twitter and I get text messages nonstop throughout the day from someone like, hey, I saw this video. I think this applies to me. Would this be okay for me to work on? And I give them either a quick yes or a quick like, no, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. And I would imagine you get such so much less of that just because of the fact that these people aren't scoping through the internet kind of you yeah. know, looking on, on these videos through social media. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Shaheen, talk to us a little bit about online lessons. I know you wrote an article for uh, golf.com that was yeah. tremendously well received and certainly <laughs> the timing of it couldn't have been better. Uh, just with this pandemic going on and everyone being locked down, I think, you know, the one thing I have noticed in the last couple of weeks is the golf community, uh, and Mark Crossfield says this, said this beautifully. He said, Golf teachers just want to teach. They don't necessarily care so much about the money. Yes, we all want to make it some revenue and we should be trying to make some revenue, but ultimately we want to teach and there's some great information flying around Instagram and the internet at the moment, free of charge for golfers to benefit from. And hopefully when things open up and this pandemic goes away, the people who've been taking advantage of all that free information will remember who they've been getting it from and come back and give those golf coaches a little bit of support. But uh, talk to us about online and how you set it up and what, what, what you use. Yeah, so I'm on a platform called Skillist. It's kind of what the okay. golf.com article was about. Uh, I've been associated to this platform for probably three years give or take two and a half years. I mean, I've, I've been on that platform probably since they started, to be honest. I think I was one of the first coaches who signed up to it. Um, and I, I kind of offer one of two things, either, every, first of all, every online lesson I give, I will usually follow up a voiceover where I'm like, you know, drawing lines over their golf swing and they hear my voice yeah. on top of the, the visual of what they're seeing of their own golf swing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll send them a video like that that could be anywhere between, you know, six, seven to 15 minutes, depending on how much there is to talk about for that player. Yeah. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll typically follow that up with a video of me on camera explaining it then visually because some people are visual learners. So you need to cater to both types of learners. Uh, and at the same time, obviously, I'll showcase the drills and explain exactly how to go about it and create kind of like a practice plan for them. So I, I offer that as like a one-off lesson if somebody wants to come see me and do that. But at the same time, I also have monthly program students, which I much typically prefer. And they're the students that, you know, you pay kind of like a lump sum per month and okay. they, can, they can contact me and keep up to date as often as possible because, you know, the reality is oftentimes, and I'm sure you deal with this with in-person lessons too, a guy's taking a lesson, right? And if he doesn't contact you within the three weeks or the four weeks or however long it is between those two lessons, they might have not worked on things the appropriate way. They might have kind of overdid something or they didn't maybe yeah. necessarily understand it to its fullest degree. So with this monthly program stuff, at least the people can follow up to me. So I'm like, look, you're not maybe practicing it the way you should be. You know, here's a quick little checkup. I'll send them a two minute video of me kind of explaining how I want them to do it differently. And so that way they never kind of veer off track. And I offer mm -hmm. one of the two. And I mean, uh, honestly, it's been booming, obviously, with this virus situation. We're one of the lucky people that our, our finances haven't gone down, fortunately for us. And yes. um, 
you know, it's amazing how many coaches have actually contacted me in the last week or two uh, to say like, hey, what are you doing with Skillist? Can we talk about it a little bit? Like, what? how do you yeah. set it up yourself? And obviously, I'm happy to do so for people. I mean, there's enough, there's enough golfers struggling for all of us, so. Exactly, exactly. We don't need to uh, shut anybody out, I believe. Um, I, you use Skillist, and I think Skillist is similar to Coach Now. It's very possible. Like I mean, I've actually never been on Coach Now, but I've, I've okay. heard, I know of a lot of people who do use it, so I would imagine they're similar. Yes, I, I, I use Coach Now, and, uh, and it's fantastic. You can do the exact same thing. You can film yourself. It's a great way to stay in touch with students. I've most probably got close to a thousand students in my Coach Now app, and any of them can reach out at any time and send a video, ask a question. Um, just kind of, it's easy to check in on people, so I really like it. For that reason, I'm sure you can do the same there. Yeah, and I would say that if there's one thing that somebody who's an up-and-coming coach who wants to generate some revenue, I mean, even if you're getting on an app like that or not, like there, it doesn't hurt to send a message out to even your in-person students in your own local city and say, hey, if you have somehow a way to keep practicing, you know, we can offer kind of like a smaller price of something just for you to keep checking up on me. It doesn't, obviously, we can't be together, but it doesn't mean that we have to stop working together. You know, oftentimes there's so many different creative solutions you can come up with to make sure that somebody doesn't either give up the game altogether or go see another coach because you're not offering the service. I mean, you know, locally or not, there, there's the possibilities to keep coaching are endless right now. I mean, it's not as though you have to just sit at home and do nothing. There's ton, tons of apps. I mean, you said it, right? There's Coach Now, there's Skillist. I'm sure there are tons of more. Huddle. Huddle, obviously, a yeah. lot of people do that. And, you know, there's so many different ways uh, for people to keep in touch with players and keep making money. So if you're a coach, take advantage right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Shohit, there was a question from, from somebody that uh, appears to be a high school coach where they said, small start said, any advice for a high school golf coach with 20 plus beginning golfers? You have a go at that and then I'll, I'll have a go at that one. So the question, the question was that they want to know how to start with their players? Yeah, I, I, I suspect they're going, what can we do? We've got a golf team, high school golf team with 20 relatively fresh golfers in the program. How should they go about it? So this is obviously going to be difficult for any coach because everybody's different. Everybody moves in different ways and you can't like teach a uniform method to everybody because there are some players who are going to excel and there's obviously going to be some players who are not going to succeed. And your goal as a coach, I think, in my opinion, when you're dealing with a lot of people is to get everybody to succeed, right? Like find the yeah. plan that's going to get everybody to excel, not to have one stud that's good, that you're going to have to rely on. Um, so in a thing like that, I would suggest – First of all, as a coach, learn more about the matchups. I mean, we kind of just spoke about this, right? Find, find the right combination of variables that works. Find out why they work and how they work. And then when you're going to start dealing with player to player, treat them all individually. Do not teach gr group people as a group. Deal with them as if they're all their own individual player because they are. And they're going to learn differently and they're going to have their own movement patterns. So I think the mistake that a lot of coaches make when they deal with large groups of people, and especially these high school coaches, if they're just starting out, is that they teach too much of a one method to the entire group as opposed to treating everybody as their own individual type of person. Yeah, and, and uh, interestingly, I would come at it a little differently. If I had a large group of students, so I, I, I'm the coach and we're going to go out and all stand on the range. I'm going to present on a daily basis. I'm going to talk about general principles. And to me, I like to think of general principles as things every golfer on the planet can use to get better. Club speed. I'm going to set everybody up on my team with some club speed training protocol. They're going to get faster. Impact location. I'm going to show them how to start to hit the center of the face and get some feedback. And so I'm really, I'm actually going to teach them as a group and i'm going to present the information as a, in a group type fashion where i would go there's too many kids to teach as onesies because ultimately i'm going to spend four minutes a day with each kid if i'm going one at a time right and then uh, so i would go I, I would go general principles low point control club speed putting touch uh, those kind of ideas we can all think of plenty of general principles that young starter golfers can all benefit from 
And then as they progress, I'm going to start to work one on one on one a little bit further down the road. And so maybe just, you know, not trying to oppose what you said. I, I certainly get what you said. You're looking at it a little differently than I'm looking at it. That would just be my take as to. I, I, yeah, I actually, I, I actually, to be honest, I don't disagree with you at all. That's, that's a good point you're making is that you're not teaching. But this is the difference, right? Is that you're not teaching yeah. a uniform method to swing the club. Correct. You are, you are teaching uniform principles that every good golfer has on the PGA Tour, which Correct. is they all swing very fast. They all do not three putt every single green that they're getting on. You know, they're all going to have some relatively simple, easy to go to rely on short game techniques that people yeah. can do that are like these anti hosel anti chunk kind of methods, right? Yeah. That we obviously all teach these high handicap players. Um, so I, I mean, I don't disagree with you one bit. I like that. I like that because of the fact that you're not teaching a uniform swing method. You're teaching uniform yeah. principles that everybody needs to have if they want to become a good golfer. Well said. Well said. Certainly, I, and, and I think. I think our different approaches there, your answer and my answer, go against each other. And that's a little bit of what happens in modern day golf instruction. When these golfers are out there surfing the web, looking for information, they go, there's all this contradicting advice. Well, you're coming at it from teaching the better golfer where they've got their swing already and you're trying to make what they've got work. And I'm teaching golfers that typically don't have their swings. Typically, I teach a lot of good players too, but typically don't have their swings. And so I'm going to give them some general principles and they're going to go, man, I really got better. That was great. Uh, it's, so it's funny because it relies on your experience, right? Because of the fact that your groupings of players that you deal with a lot yes. are these guys who need that kind of general type of information. That's already how your mind is kind of wired to think. So you go that route. Whereas because I'm so individualistic in the sense that I work with a lot of these professionals and like college kids, I don't often teach these group mo models. Correct. And so obviously my mind is not going to be, is not going to be thinking about it the same way because I don't deal with them nearly to the extent that you do, which For I think sure. is great. I mean, obviously we, we, we want to specialize. I mean, I think the best thing that every coach can do is at a certain point you need to specialize to cater to the type of players that you're dealing with. If you don't have too much of a specialization, you're never going to succeed in my opinion. Agreed. Agreed. Huge. Huge. Um, 100%. Spot on. Um, Shaheen, come on. What else uh, can we talk about? I see we've got a question from Mark Grace, who's been prolific with his questions this week. Uh, yeah. The transition, Mark Grace's statement I've used a few times, the transition is the new impact. <laughs> uh, he used that earlier in the week. He says, do you prefer rotation for face control? Tips to create rotation through impact. Let me ask you that. Shoheen, do you believe that uh, improved, let's call it body rotation through impact, uh, do you believe that aids in controlling the face better? I'll tell you why I believe that is the case. And um, this might be a different viewpoint than maybe the different the other answers that you've gotten in the past. I just posted a video yesterday on the matchups between the face angle and the release pattern of the golfer and how they need to work together. So okay. if somebody hasn't seen that video, I would highly suggest going to see it. It clarifies a lot of what I'm about to say, which is when the face angle is open in the downswing, it is impossible for a player to develop shaft lean and still hit a good shot because shaft lean alone as a movement will want to open the club face up more. Assuming, yes. you're not, assuming you're not twisting the grip at the same time, if you just lean the handle forward, the face opens, right? Okay. And so... Yeah. When the face angle is open, in order for you to find a way to square it, you need to start th releasing the hands early, which prevents you from turning, right? Yeah. So when you get the face angle in a position that is a little less open in the downswing, which would be a little bit more closed, that allows for more body rotation because the body rotation is going to deliver shaft wing the shaft lean is going to offset the fact that the face is a little closed, meaning it doesn't need to have so much rotation through the ball. Yeah. So I think it's kind of like the chicken or the egg. You know, you can say the rotation of the body gives face control, but I think face control gives rotation of the body. I think it kind of works hand in hand. And if you don't get the face in a good spot coming down, you cannot get the rotation of the body. So you have to almost look at it backwards at the same time as looking at forwards where yeah. they, they need to work to get. It's not like one gives the other. 
I don't think necessarily body rotation gives face control. I think they both need to exist for them to work together. It's not a question of if I just rotate my body and the face is open, I'll have face control. Well, no, you won't. You're just going to hit it a mile off the planet and you're not going to hit it anywhere near your target. So yeah. I think that they need to work together. I don't think it's a, a question of one delivers the other. I, now, I agree with you, but I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. I work with almost all of my players, the everyday golfers that I teach, on getting the club face in place, getting the face stronger, exactly what you've said, so that there can be uh, more lateral shift, more rotation, all of that, that combination, okay, to stop the face from getting really flippy through impact. Mm -hmm. How would you describe Sam Sneed's club face on the way down? Honestly, I don't even remember what his swing looks like to be able to tell you. Is his club face angle open on the way down? Is it like toe up and back? It, it, it looks like that. <laughs> and the reason why I bring that up is because Sam Snead could clearly hit. Um, he, could, he was really good and he got insanely open. Him and Hogan were massively open. And they both, to me, had club faces that seemed to be a little more this way than this way on the way down. Right. So at a certain point, you need to also understand the face-to-path relationship of a player in order to deliver desired results. When the face angle is open, you don't only need to square it by releasing the handle of the club this way. You can square that face up by swinging far enough out to in on the ball to get the face to start left of your target line to play that fade that they typically will prefer. So yeah. there's a lot of different ways a player can square the face up. If they are doing that much rotation with the face slightly open, I would imagine for the most part that those players are fading the ball. Now, if they weren't, we would have to look a little bit more into the 3D model of how much other forearms actually turning through the ball. Because if they are, then they're just really skilled enough to get that to happen at the same time. Because just keep in mind, just because your body rotates does not automatic automatically imply that your forearms aren't going to rotate. Right at the same sure, time, sure, sure. there are some golfers who rotate their body but also have a little bit of some of this happening through the ball. All of a sudden, if you get the two to time up together, I mean, and you have the skill to support it, you can hit any shot you want. Yeah. And so, Shoin, just tying into Mark's question, uh, tips to create rotation. My take is this, and please feel free to tell me that I'm crazy when I share this with you, is I'm going to get a little demo going here. The more the club head is behind the golfer – on the way down in early transition, the more the golfer is incentivized to rotate. Because the club head is behind, the more the club head stays forward in early transition, the less incentive the golfer has to rotate. And so to me, if, if I wanna stimulate rotation in a golfer, Sergio, let's get the club head behind behind the golfer in transition and early downswing so that they have every reason on the planet to go ahead and rotate like a maniac uh, versus being a little steep and, and, and stunting your rotation, so to speak. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so I'll, I can explain this in a variety of ways. I think it's important to understand what rotation does to your body parts. If I just stand here, right, and let's say like I'm in a golf swing here, if I yeah. stick my arm out and I'm not going to like manufacture any type of movement, I'm just going to kind of like lock it in place. You know, when yeah. I rotate my body in the downswing, I'm rotating in this type of direction. The hands in the body are going to come with me. So the more my body creates rotation in the downswing, the more the variable is trying to get in front of my body. Right. And yes. so in order for me to create rotation, I need the variables to first be far enough behind me to prevent them from getting too far in front of me. Right. Yes, well said. And, yeah, so, like that. and so in order for me to be able to create the rotation of my body, I need the shaft to be offset and far enough back first so that when I do turn, they don't end up way out in front of me over the top, pulling it where my club path gets 11 degrees out to in. And you see that with the slicer all day. So there is a huge component of making sure the club head is way behind the player first. So that when you do add the rotation, it starts to get more in front of them without getting physically all the way in front of them, if that makes sense. Perfect sense. Perfect sense. And I hope everybody got that because that's so huge. Uh, I, you know, just the more the club head is forward, the less likely the player is to rotate. The more the club head is back, the more likely they are to rotate. And so what can we do? We use this term shallowing, but ultimately 
I think it's more about uh, club head location. You know, club head location. It's not so much about where the arms are. It's more about where the club head is. And if we get the club head in a good spot, now we've got the ability to go ahead and rotate. The incentive. Yeah, I, we've got to read I, I, I also think there's two ways you can look at rotation. Everybody looks at it in terms of the actual rotary component of rotation, but there's also a tilting component of rotation that's equally important in that. And yeah. you can try to get a player to turn, but if they don't have the proper tilting patterns of their body, they're going to find it very difficult to create rotation, even if the shaft and the club head is in the appropriate position to be able to allow it to happen, right? And so what I tell people is there's a huge difference between continuous rotation, meaning their body is not stalling, where the tilting pattern of the body is in the way that we need it, versus how fast are you turning, which is the velocity of the rotation. You know, people look at rotation as in, I want to get really open before impact. I look at rotation as in, I just want you to keep turning. The rate in which you're going to turn is going to vary from player to player. Yes. I can't get every player to rotate super fast through the golf ball. Some people don't have the physical ability to be able to do that. But if I can get them to keep turning without stalling, I can still get the hand path to curve inwards through the ball because they're not stalling out, which is my opinion is far more important than saying, hey, I'm 50 degrees open at impact with my hips because it doesn't really matter nearly as much as are you still turning or are you doing this guy, you know? Dipping, yeah. Um, Shoheen, I've noticed we've had a couple of questions. Uh, physical ability to rotate. Typically older is going to have less ability. What's your take on that? Uh, first of all, create the freedom to allow it to happen. So kind of relates right back to what I just said. You know, tilt the player. Every player, for the most part, will have some ability to be able to tilt their body in certain ways. It doesn't mean they have to do it to an extreme. But if they're too level with their body lines, their chances of rotating are very minimal. Now, if you are dealing with a player who literally cannot rotate, they've had hip replacement surgery, shoulder surgery, or something that doesn't necessarily allow for it to happen, cater to their needs. Don't get the shaft in too shallow of a position. They're going to yeah. hit blocks nonstop. So yeah. if, if a player comes to me and they can't turn, that's totally fine. I mean, there are players that physically will never be able to create that rotation. It does, then all of a sudden you start to fall into the matchup category of saying, okay, you can't turn, that's fine. I'll just get your shaft in the appropriate position to match it, which is going to be less shallow because you cannot have a shallow shaft. If you can't turn, you're not going to swing very well through the golf ball. Yeah, yeah. And I will also say this to the coaches watching. Um, I haven't seen an older golfer that wasn't able to turn a little more. They might not be able to get like Sam Snead and Hogan, but they can all turn a little bit more if we get things better, when we get things better. For sure. Uh, I would agree with that 100%. Shohin, talk just, we've got like three minutes. If you could talk a little bit about some tilts. You've mentioned tilts in, in, throughout the golf swing a couple of times. Can you share with us what, what you're referring to there? Yeah, you want to give me a second? I'll even go get an alignment stick and even show people. That'd be so awesome. Have, Thank you. So they have a better understanding of it. Paul Wayland, whilst Shoheen's gone, Paul, you asked, is it possible for the club head to get too far behind the player? Most definitely. Most definitely. If the player starts tipping, uh, getting the club head behind them, dropping everything down, sliding a lot, now the club head's going to get too far behind them. That's where we've got to keep what Shoheen's going to talk about right, right here. The tilt's in place coupled with that rotation. Now the club head will get pulled out of that hole that it's been dumped in back there. Yeah, so I'm going to answer his question quickly too. I also think it's possible to get the club head too far behind you if your arm structure is just way too flat in the backswing and behind your body. At a certain yeah. point, the positioning of your hands in the backswing are going to dictate how far behind you the club gets. If your hands are out here, the club won't be so far behind you. If your hands are way back here, they will. So you also have to look at the arm structure because that might be the root cause of the problem of how far from the inside and behind you that club head is getting. So when we're talking about tilts, there's two main components. There's obviously the shoulder plane everybody knows in the back swing. So back shoulder obviously is going to be higher. Front shoulder is going to be lower, right? But we also need to look at it as in a pelvis component, which is when we're rotating in the back swing, our knees are typically going to change flex, or that is where my preference certainly lies, which is to tilt the pelvis in a way where we're trying to match the shoulder plane to some degree feel-wise with the hips which is where yeah. that back hip needs to get more elevated. The front hip needs to get lower. And you can do that through, you know, extending some of that back knee up a little bit. You don't want to lock the knee joint, but you certainly want to lose some flex to that back leg. 
to allow that hip to get higher. What I see a lot with players who stall out is that because they retain too much flex on both knees, their pelvis is too level. Their hips are too much at the same height in the backswing. So what ends up happening is as soon as they start to shift laterally in transition, that front shoulder and hip are going to start to get elevated too fast. All of a sudden, you're stuck in a scenario where if your body starts tilting this way, it's not going to magically go back down. It's falling back. And you're going to end up getting caught behind the golf ball. So creating the proper inclinations to not only the shoulder plane, but also the pelvis in the backswing is super important for allowing the, ball to, the golfer to be able to rotate through the ball. 100% spot on. Yeah. Um, I love that. I, I really do love that. I think that's huge. And it's something that typically better players have not understood for a long time. It's been uh, an undercoached element, I would say. I think that's a big role, plays a big role in helping the player keep the face where we need it, control the face that much better through, through impact. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't want to kind of call out names, but unfortunately, I'm going to mention him here. Jason Day is a guy that I've obviously been critical of a little bit in the past where, you know, because he retains so much flex to that back knee, his pelvis gets very level, his hands get very tall. And then you see a lot of this kind of steep and kind of tilty pattern with him in the downswing, yeah. which to be fair, to some degree has definitely influenced his back injuries, but also it's created a lot of timing elements where he goes on these hot streaks because he's on with his timing and then he disappears off leaderboards yeah. for, you know, a month or two at a time. I mean, obviously the tilting pattern to his pelvis, in my opinion, would be the first thing I would work on with him because he's not doing himself any favors with his legwork in the backswing. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Hey, Shoheen, I really appreciate your time and your insights, your passion. Uh, I love to learn from you. I love to listen to you. Thank you so much. You always make sense. Uh, we are, and I know a lot of people don't know this, but we're so excited to have you coming to join us at, uh, at Coach Camp. Wouldn't it be good if you could get one of your players or a couple of your players to win an event and, and get in the Masters, you know? <laughs> that would be ideal. So, yeah, I guess, I guess since you mentioned it, I will be at Coach Camp with Andrew and the guys. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. We've got some good presenters we're working on. We don't have the final lineup yet, uh, but really it's going to be good. We've got Mark Bull and yourself that we've let out of the bag so far. Um, and I must say, I'm super excited to have you guys. And God willing, we'll be able to have it by then. Hopefully, otherwise we'll all be insane by then. Who will care? No one will matter. And uh, so thank you so much for coming on. Really looking forward to it and all the best. Keep up the great work, mate. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Stay safe. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, eh? Thanks, everyone.